Well, hello viewers, Nick Carver here. And today, I am excited because this is the first video of a new series I'm working on called Behind the Glass with the Glass. And this is gonna be fun. It's gonna be a recurring video series on my channel here. You know, I'd like to say it's gonna be once a week, but realistically, I know that's probably not gonna happen. I tend to get caught up with work, but I think you're gonna like what I got planned for you here. Basically, the concept is this. I love photography. I never get tired of it, I never get bored of it, and uh, I never get tired of talking about it. And I also enjoy a little drinky poo now and then, especially at the end of a long day after a stressful photo shoot. I like to come home, crack open a cold one, or pour myself a little whiskey neat, and uh, kick back and relax, unwind a bit. And the whole world of uh, beer and spirits and wine and all that stuff is fascinating to me because A, I don't know much about it. I just kind of know what I like and don't like. But I also find it very similar to photography in that it's a blend of science and art. You know, to create a really nice whiskey, you have to be a bit of a technician and an artist. You know, it, it takes both the creative and the scientific to execute this, much like photography. And so I thought it'd be kind of interesting to take something I love, and I know a lot about photography, and combine it with something I like and I don't really know much about, which is uh, enjoying a beverage now and then. And so with each episode, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select a uh, beer or a whiskey or a mixed drink or a rum or a, a wine or something and I'm going to enjoy that drink while discussing some photography topic with you. And what I'm hoping is maybe you'll kick back at home with me, crack yourself a little uh, cold one, and uh, sip along as we talk photography. This is you and me sitting down for a drink and photography talk. And by the way, this here, this is Tess. She is my pride and joy, my beloved, my flame, my muse. She's 14 and a half, and I know what you're thinking. She doesn't look a day past 13. I love her dearly. She's going to be joining me sometimes. Um, but now on this first episode, I have chosen this delicious whiskey, Basil Hayden's. It's a Kentucky bourbon whiskey, and this was gifted to me by a uh, long-term student slash customer slash client slash close friend now. Um, she gifted me this because she has excellent taste. That's really what it boils down to. This um, bourbon whiskey is one of my favorites on my bar cart, and I got a lot of whiskeys on my bar cart, so that's saying something. But let me tell you a little bit about this. So uh, I had to do some research on this, and this is kind of how the show is going to go. I'm going to try and research the drink a little bit and tell you about it, tell you what I learned. Um, first off, it's bourbon which I had to look up what exactly makes a bourbon whiskey a bourbon whiskey. And it's that uh, my friend Google here helped me out. Um, it's a whiskey that's distilled from corn. For whiskey to be considered bourbon, the grain mash must be at least 51% corn. On top of that, by law, the mixture must be stored in charred oak containers and cannot contain any additives, which is, I guess, why pretty much every bourbon is uh, notes of, uh, it's got a smoky, oaky, uh, aftertaste, whatever. By the way, I'm not one of those guys where I can sniff it, swirl it around in my mouth and be like, mm. yes, licorice and um, roses. I don't know. I'm not super refined. I'm a simpleton when it comes to this, but I do know what I like and don't like, and I love this. Now, Basil Hayden's. Um, this bourbon whiskey is uh, part of Jim Beam's small batch collection, so it's under the Jim Beam banner. Runs about $40 a bottle. And uh, Wine Enthusiast gave it quite a good rating at 93. And Wine Enthusiast has this to say about it. Uh, Basil Hayden's Bourbon Whiskey is an artfully aged, light and easy to sip spirit that features a delicious and clean finish. It is a craft bourbon unlike any other. I agree, it's a very delicious and clean finish. That's probably my favorite part about it, is the finish. And like all bourbons, well, not all bourbons, but all good bourbons, it smells pretty damn good. So, thank you to Kim for picking out a very lovely bourbon whiskey. 
I am going to enjoy it greatly. And I actually already have quite a bit. <laughs> mm. I tend to prefer my whiskey neat, meaning no ice, but I won't scoff at it if there's a nice big ice cube in there. So that's what we're drinking today. But let's talk about uh, the photography stuff now. Um, first off, as this show goes along over the, the months and years, I know it's going to evolve and it's going to become something else. Um, I'm hoping it will kind of steer towards interviews and maybe I'll get some one-on-one -on -one stuff here with other professional photographers and, um, and things like that. But one direction I would like it to kind of go in is uh, viewer questions. So in other words, I would love it if, if you guys have questions, technical, related to photography, related to being a professional photographer, related to the business of photography, related to film photography, whatever. I'd love you to submit it. And if I think it's a good fit for the show, then uh, I will read the question and kind of give you my thoughts on it. So if you have questions, submit them to BGWG. That's behind the glass with the glass at nickcarverphoto.com. So BGWG at nickcarverphoto.com. Um, and hopefully by the next episode, I'll have some questions and maybe I can work on those. But before we get into what I want to talk about today, um, I want to just give you some news and updates. First off, uh, I got a few videos coming down the pike. So I'm working on three videos uh, currently. One of them, I'm going to be making a very large fine art piece. Uh, so one of those videos again. I'm going to show you the scanning process, the printing process, the mounting framing process, all the way to hanging. And I'm doing that because A, I love printing, and B, I think it's probably useful to someone who hasn't done a lot of printing. Then I have two other videos that are going to piggyback on that. One of them is how to efficiently clean dust on a film scan. So um, I've gotten a lot better over the past year or two on cleaning dust off of film scans, and I want to show you some of the, the techniques I've figured out. Uh, it might save you some headache. Um, that way cleaning dust on your scans won't be quite as miserable. Don't get me wrong, it's always going to be miserable, but I'm hoping it's just going to be a little bit less with what I show you. And then another video piggyback piggybacking on that I'm really excited about. I'm going to compare a drum scan to the same negative scanned on my Epson V750 flatbed scanner using a wet mount tray. So in other words, I want to compare Epson V750 with wet mounting versus a drum scan. Cheap versus expensive, low end versus high end. And I wanna see how big the difference really is. Because for as expensive as drum scans are, I'm sure hoping they are a lot better than uh, what you get on your Epson. And then finally, last little bit of news here. I have begun work on the online course for how to manually expose film. I'm actually gonna be creating two online courses. One for how to shoot and manual for digital, one how to manually expose for film. They're going to be two separate courses. You'll be able to get both at a discounted rate if you're interested in both. Otherwise, you can kind of pick your poison. Um, that won't be coming anytime soon, I'll be honest with you. It's going to take a long time to create this course because I want to do it right. I want it to be very in-depth, very thorough, no missing holds or gaps or anything. And um, yeah, it's going to be a great course. I've worked out the outline. I think it's going to be awesome and it's going to be really helpful. The metering technique I use is very effective. Uh, I basically never bracket and uh, I get correct exposures 95% of the time. So um, I'm hoping I can pass along that knowledge to you. I appreciate your patience on that. I hope you guys are gonna like the course. I think it's gonna be great. I'm really anxious to get going on it, but I just can't get it all done uh, immediately. But that's it for news and announcements. So here's what I wanna talk about today. Um, and this is kind of a viewer question, but it's not really submitted because I've just gotten this question a lot in my videos, in the comments, which is which light meter do you use? So I thought I'd talk about that today. Um, so the light meter that I use is a Pentax digital spot meter. Um, this meter uh, is very popular amongst photographers who follow the zone system, Ansel Adams zone system. And in fact, Ansel Adams used one of these meters and uh, pointed it out explicitly in one of his books uh, as being a great meter. Um, I love this meter. Uh, I've toyed with buying a second and a third one just in case this ever breaks and they're nowhere to be found anymore. I'll have one as a backup. But uh, it's such a fantastic meter. It's so simple. There's not a lot of bells and whistles. There's not a lot of extra features. And that is great because the manual metering process I'm going to end up teaching in my course um, 
is so simple that you don't want a lot of features on your meter cluttering up the process. This is simple, it just gives you an EV reading and you can use that to figure out your exposure using the scale on the top. Um, again, I'm not gonna go into full details on how to use that because that's exactly what the course is gonna be about. It's not the kind of thing I can explain in five minutes, but um, that is the meter, it's a Pentax digital spot meter. So it's a reflected spot meter. Um, you look through here, the meter's through here. So you'll see me in my videos all the time doing something like this, checking my tones, figuring out the EV levels of all my various tones, and then I can use the scale here using my manual metering process to uh, dial in my exposure. One thing I like about this meter is A, there's only one button. Uh, so not much you have to think about when you're operating it. You're never fumbling for buttons or anything like that. There's not a, there's no digital display. There's no LED or LCD or anything like that. Uh, it has a, uh, two rotating wheels on the front here that are mechanical. And a lot of things I love about that. First off, I just love the manual click of it. I know what happened when I did it. Um, I, it doesn't need to be powered on for me to see the settings. Uh, I can literally not be pressing any button. It can be sitting in my bag and I could look down and see the settings. In fact, you'll see on my videos sometimes, this thing will be hanging around my neck and I'll just hold it up and look at my settings, put it back down. Don't need to turn it on, don't need a backlight, don't need nothing. Um, it's very simple, very easy to use. Now, you'll see a lot of other photographers using a, a reflected meter like this. So this is a Siconic um, combination spot meter, reflected and incident meter, which is what this is. Um, and this is an L508 Zoom Master. I bought this purely so I can do the online course I'm gonna, I'm gonna be making. I don't actually like using this meter. I've used it quite a bit since I got it to test it out and to learn it and to understand it. Um, of course, it can be done. You can get a correct exposure uh, using the spot meter on this, but I will tell you it is just a thousand times more difficult than doing it on this. Um, this only gives you a middle tone reading, uh, not an EV reading, or it can give you an EV reading, but it's kind of useless because you don't have a scale that you can place it on. It doesn't have a linear scale. Um, it's just not my favorite. Now I know, I'm sure there's people out there who are hearing this video right now yelling at the computer screen like, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. This is the best meter ever. Sekonic makes the best meters on the planet. I get it. It's a very precise machine, it works great, it does what it says it does perfectly, but it is too complicated. It makes the metering process more complex than it needs to be. It doesn't have a linear scale, which is far easier to use, like on this uh, Pentax digital spot meter. Um, it's a fantastic meter and I have no doubt that if this is your primary meter, I'm sure you get great exposures with it. I don't doubt that. What I'm saying is, if you think this meter, this spot meter, is better than this spot meter, you probably haven't used both extensively. I've used both extensively, and I can tell you this one is a thousand times easier to use than this one. And I would pick, th pick this over this any day of the week. That being said, these Sekonics are nice because they have a built-in incident meter. Um, incident meters are very useful for studio work uh, when you're dealing with flash, and um, they do, fine on ambient exposures for the most part, um, but I'm not a big fan of incident meters for outdoor photography and landscape photography. Studio settings, absolutely, has to be an incident meter. But uh, for outdoor work, landscape work, not a fan. And by the way, I had someone email me and they asked me, you know, what spot meter do you use? As I get that question quite often. And he said in the email, he's like, um, you know, every time I research online, everyone uh, points to the Sekonics, and it seems like everyone just rails on reflected meters. They all say to do an incident meter. Um, and I responded back, basically, those people don't know what they're talking about. Uh, incident meters are nice for certain scenarios, but uh, once you understand how to use a reflected spa meter in outdoor photography, there's kind of no going back, in my opinion. Incident meters, a monkey could use them. Uh, they're super easy. You literally click a button, it gives you your settings. So, I mean, of course, everybody loves this. It's like, what should the settings should I use? Okay, I'll use those settings. Like, they're so simple to use that everyone talks about, oh, it's the best meter. But just because it's simple to do an incident reading doesn't mean it's the right reading. Um, 
And I'll be getting into all that on the online course. Sorry to tease you guys so much, but there, there's a lot to talk about on this and uh, it'll all be covered in the course. But I guess the summary is I use a Pentax digital spot meter. It is by far my favorite meter. I have used Sekonic reflected light meters and I don't think they even hold a candle to the Pentax digital spot meters in terms of ease of use. Yes, they are precise. Yes, they do what they say they do. Yes, they got a lot of great features. But in terms of usability and doing the manual metering process, I will end up uh, showing you guys. You can't, can't beat the Pentax digital spot meter. And then the whole incident light meter thing, I should probably elaborate on that more another time, but um, incident light meters have their drawbacks. And every two, um, kind of funny to me, I'll watch other people's videos on like the metering process or how to use an incident light meter and they're talking about ratios and stuff. And it's always a little comical to me because it's like taking a super, com super simple process and basically just making it as complicated as possible just for the sake of interest. So like getting ratios and using the features and the delta and all this kind of stuff. It's like, dude, it doesn't have to be that hard. You can be super precise, much, much easier. And the first step in that is getting a, a light meter that is simple, doesn't have a lot of unnecessary features. So Pentax digital spot meter, one of my favorite pieces of equipment. All right. Well, there you go. That's episode number one, baby. Behind the glass with the glass. Hashtag BGWG. All right, I'm sorry for that. Um, yeah, so submit your questions to BGWG at nickcarverphoto.com. I'd love to address them. And, um, you know, go out and get yourself some Basil Hayden's if you're a whiskey guy or a whiskey gal. Um, it's delicious, neat. I think it would pair well with a steak. If I may say so myself. So thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Until next time, cheers. Mm -hmm.